Part 4 Surviving at McKinsey In Part 4, you will learn a few tricks for surviving not just at McKinsey, but in any high-pressure organization. Whether you're trying to maintain your sanity while traveling for weeks at a time, trying to climb the greasy pole to success in your organization, or just trying to have a life while working 100 hours per week, there's something in Part 4 that will help. As a bonus, I'll also shed a little light on the McKinsey recruiting process and even give a few tips for those of you who would like to try to join the firm yourselves. Contrary to what you might imagine after reading this far, there is more to life at McKinsey than work. Then again, there's not all that much more, which is why part 4 is so short. 14. Find your own mentor. Take advantage of others' experience if you can. Find someone senior in your organizer tie-in to be your mentor. As Tarzan once remarked, it's a jungle out there. To make your way through the corporate rainforest, it helps to have a guide, someone more experienced than you who can show you the hidden tracks and steer you clear of the quicksand. These days, the fashionable word for such a guide is mentor. McKinsey maintains a comprehensive system of mentoring for its client service staff. Every consultant, from analyst to director asterisk is assigned a mentor to monitor and guide his or her career through the firm. On the face of it, this sounds like a wonderful idea, it certainly seemed that way to me when, as an MBA, I was considering whether to join McKinsey's New York office. As with so many wonderful ideas, the execution left a lot to be desired. I was assigned a mentor within my first week in the office, a very nice 30-something partner. He bought me lunch at a trendy Italian eatery where supermodels popped in to nibble on. Arugula leaves. We talked about working at the firm and how best. To climb its greasy pole to success, it was a pleasant and informa tie 45 minutes. I saw him once after that. Within about six months, he transferred to Mexico to open a new office for the firm south of the border. After that, I got lost in the shuffle for several months. Even to Ally I was reassigned to another mentor. Although he had a good reputation as a mentor, I was one of nine or ten ments that he had, and I got very little out of the relationship beyond the pro forma dissection of my performance reviews. So, was I cast adrift in the sea of McKinsey without a guide? Hardly. I did what most McKinseyites do when they want to SUC seed in the firm, I hitched my wagon to a star. I did most of my work with one ED, the same ED who recruited me into the firm. 142 Surviving at McKinsey Asterisk actually, only the newer directors have mentors. In the case of the most senior directors, there is no one in the firm to guide them. Rumors that certain senior DCSs have a direct video conferencing line to a higher power can be safely dismissed. We had a good relationship, call it chemistry. When I needed advice I couldn't get elsewhere, I went to him. He tried to get me assigned to his teams on studies where I had expertise. I was confident that, as long as I performed well for him, he would be in my corner when it came to assignments, reviews, and promotions. My experience was typical of most McKinseyites. How much you benefited from your official mentor was pretty much a matter of luck. If you wanted guidance, you had to go out and get it. I believe that's a lesson that applies in almost any large organization. Find someone senior to you whose abilities and opinion you respect, seek out the mentor's advice. Many people like to give advice and are happy to dispense it when asked. Of course, it helps if you get along well too. Work with the mentor, if possible, and learn all you can. Don't go to the well too often, however, you don't want to become a pest. Whatever setup your organization has, make sure you find your own mentor. 15 Surviving on the Road Traveling across the country, or the globe, can take a lot out of you. Making travel an adventure will lighten your load. So will proper planning and a good attitude. Although working at McKinsey offers many advantages, good pay, interesting work, high-caliber colleagues, the working candy tie-ins can be grueling. On top of the long hours, 
which routinely include all-nighters, many McKinsey consultants spend most of their time on the road, away from home, family, and friends. Sometimes business travel for the firm can be fun, a week in London or Paris, and why not take the weekend skiing in the Alps? Just as often, however, working out of town only adds to the grind. There is nothing quite so mind-numbing, as one former EM noted, as the, if it's Tuesday, this must be Davenport, cross-country trips a consultant has to make when visiting all of, say, a manufacturer ING company's many plants across America. Even worse, you can find yourself commuting 1,000 miles every Monday morning, or Sunday night, to some far-flung client, as happened to Hamish McDermott, who spent six long, cold months in Detroit working for one of the big car makers. That kind of travel takes a toll on your health, your relationships, and your sanity, asterisk McKinseyites have developed a number of ways to cope with the rigors of travel. They all agree on the importance of maintain ING a proper attitude. Abe Bleiberg says, try to look on business travel as an adventure. Even if I'm stuck in Flint, Michigan for three months over the winter, at least I can tell my grandchildren, I survived a winter in Flint. Not everyone can say that. Jason Klein adds. Act like a tourist. Make the most of where you are. If you're doing a project in Northern California and you're a golfer. 146 Surviving at McKinsey. Asterisk on a personal note, I was a rare exception in that I spent only one night away from home while working for clients. Most of my clients were New York-based financial firms, so my commute meant getting on the subway to Wall Street. Because of this, I was regarded by my far-flung associate classmates with a certain amount of jealousy. On the other hand, I missed out on all those frequent flyer miles. Take an afternoon and play Pebble Beach. You can keep your nose to the grindstone for only so long. Remember that travel is an opportunity to do things outside your normal realm of experience. Here's Abe Bleiberg again. Traveling as much as I did for McKinsey enabled me to meet people whom I would never otherwise have met. For instance, I once worked on a project where, in one meeting, people sat around a table trying to market toilet tissue. Never in a million years would I have ever been involved in selling toilet paper. It's not something I'd want to dedicate my life to, but that's part of the fun of working at the firm. Another key to surviving on the road, proper planning. If POS Seibel, schedule your time at the client to make sure you are at home on Fridays or Mondays. Pack light, learn what you need to have with you on the road, rather than what you think you need. If you can help it, fly with hand luggage only, just don't assume the airline will let you take that extra carry-on bag. If you're going to be in one place for a long time, find out if the hotel has a room where you can store your extra bags when you leave for the weekend, and make sure it's not the employee smoking room, as Adam Gold learned the hard way. Find a reliable cab company. If you're rent ING a car, make sure you have clear and accurate directions to your destination. Otherwise, you might find yourself, as once happened to Hamish McDermott, coming off the interstate and onto the meanest of Detroit's mean streets with no on-ramp in sight, that's the sort of adventure you can do without. Don't let the travel and the work become all-consuming, esp. Sily if you're out of town for a long time. Find a way to entertain yourself outside of work. Find colleagues, client team members, or maybe old friends from business school or college too. Surviving on the Road 147 have dinner with and catch a show or a ball game. At the very least, when you get back to the hotel do something before you go to sleep, whether it's working out, reading, or just watching television. Don't let being on the road become an uninterrupted cycle of working, eating, and sleeping. For one final survival tip I am indebted to Eric Hartz, now president of Security First Network Bank. He says, Treat everyone with tremendous respect. Sometimes McKin say people can be demanding and impatient, then they fail to understand why they don't get what they want. Some of my colleagues were amazed at how I would get upgraded, or would get a bag on after the plane was full, things like that. 
Flight attendants, concierges, assistants at clients, these PEOPLE have more authority than you realize and want to help those who show respect for them. It also keeps your stress level down, it's easier to be friendly than frustrated, so it's a win slash win. That's possibly the best advice in this book. 16. Take these three things with you wherever you go. Narrow your traveling needs down to the very few things you must have with you when you leave. Here are a few, mostly serious, ideas. Anybody who travels frequently, whether for business or for plea sure, knows the three things you always take with you when traveling abroad, the famous PTM, passport, tickets, money. Whenever I travel on business, I always make sure I have three additional things with me, a copy of my itinerary, a list of the names and numbers of everyone I'm going to see, and a good book. Since, as I've said before, things at McKinsey usually come in threes, I asked the former McKinseyites I interviewed what three things they always have with them when they travel. Here are some of the answers grouped by category, after all, this is a McKinsey list, along with explanatory notes, where appropriate. Clothing an extra shirt or blouse spare ties for the men spare pair of comfortable flat shoes for the women casual clothes workout clothes, it's easy to let your fitness slide when you're on the road. A cashmere sweater for keeping warm and comfy on overnight flights. Tools a writing pad a pad of graph paper for hand drawing charts, a copy of whatever you sent to the client an HP 12C calculator, better than a Swiss army knife although not quite as impressive on a date. Personal care items, a toothbrush, a shaving kit for the men. 150 surviving at McKinsey. A mini makeup kit for the women, antacid tablets, a bottle of Tylenol, a big bottle of Tylenol. Things to keep you organized and in touch, a personal organizer, credit cards, I keep them in a separate wallet. The OAGTM or other airline timetable, a cell phone, if I forget anything, I can just have it faxed. Directions to the client, so you don't end up in the wrong part of Detroit, diversions, a good book, press clippings to read on the plane books on tape, especially if your travel includes long stretches of driving video games on a laptop computer. The prize for the oddest answer has to go to a former McKinseyite from the Dusseldorf office who listed Coca-Cola. I traveled quite a bit in Eastern Europe. I can now drink coke warm, cold, or hot without blinking. Perhaps that belongs under personal care. If these answers have a common theme, it's, be prepared. Make sure you're never caught short without something you really need. That being the case, the prize for the best three items goes to a former associate in the Washington DC office, who justifiably wishes to remain anonymous. Our hero spent much of his time consulting in Brazil where the weather, among other things, is unpredictable. This would be Boy Scout's three indispensable items, an umbrella, sunglasses, and a box of condoms. A good assistant is a lifeline. Call the position secretary, administrative assistant, or whatever. The person who takes your messages, keeps your schedule, does your typing, duplicating, and filing, and performs a dozen other office tasks is an exceptionally valuable resource. Treat your secretary well. In McKinsey's New York office, the competition to hire good SEC Red Aries is as intense as that for top MBA graduates. Like any large organization, McKinsey would fall apart were it not for an efficient cadre of secretaries to handle the myriad administrative duties that the consultants are unavailable, unwilling or, frankly, unable to do. When consultants are on the road for much of the time, their secretaries are the lifeline that ties them to the rest of the firm. To attract the best, the firm provides a real career path for secretaries. New recruits usually start out working with four or five associates. The good ones move on to work for SEMs, the best get claimed by partners and directors. Secretaries receive regular training, just like consultants, and they even get their own retreat every year. But there's more to the path than that. Many of the managers running the firm's administrative and recruiting functions started out as seeker. Terry's, 
Now they have positions of considerable power and responsibility. All this is designed to help McKinsey attract and retain the best secretaries, just as it seeks to attract and retain the best consultants. A good secretary will perform numerous tasks that make a McKinsey consultant's life easier. These range from the obvious, such as typing, filing, and duplicating, to the not-so-obvious, filling out time sheets, paying credit card bills for consultants on long assignments, and sending flowers to significant others after yet another missed date. In fact, it is the less obvious tasks that really make a difference in a consultant's life. Most McKinseyites can do their own typing, many handle their own filing, and anyone can run the copier in a pinch. But knowing that there is someone back home whom you can trust to do those other, niggling little things that you would normally do if you were not 500 miles from your apartment for the next six months, that's going to make your life easier. The alternative is pretty ugly. I saw a number of associates whose lives were a living hell because their secretaries were not up to scratch. Files got lost, faxes misdirected, messages appeared. 154 surviving at McKinsey. Days after they were taken, clients were upset by poor telephone manners. One consultant, who was keeping two boyfriends in ignorance of each other, had her cover blown when her secretary, instead of saying she was in Houston all week, told boyfriend number BR1 that she was at a lunch date with boyfriend number two. Associates at McKinsey have to take potluck with their secretaries. I was extremely lucky. Sandy, my secretary, was excellent from the start. Although I shared her with four other consultants, she always came through for me. I always gave her top marks in her evaluations, this made me nervous, because I was afraid a partner would poach her. I made a point of treating her well. This meant not just giving her flowers on Secretary's Day and something nice at Christmas, it meant giving her the respect she deserved in her job and making her job as easy to perform as possible. I always tried to give my secretary clear instructions about what I wanted. I let her know where I was at all times during the day, so that she could reach me with important news or let clients and other consultants get in contact with me. Most important, I tried whenever possible to give her a chance to show initiative and make her own decisions, in putting together presentations, in running my schedule, and in acting as my interface with other consultants. This made ours a relationship from which we both benefited. These days, of course, a lot of people do not have a full-time secretary. Maybe they just have a temp who comes in for a few hours a week, or a junior team member who gets stuck with the grunt work. The principle remains, treat them well, be clear about what you want, and give them room to grow. Sure, a temp will never rise in the corporate ranks, but you will still get better work out of him if you treat him with respect. The junior team member, on the other hand, will benefit immensely from a bit of careful nurturing. Take the time to train her well answering her questions and showing her the ropes will benefit you too 18 recruiting mckinsey style how to do it and how to get through it mckinsey looks for specific attributes in a recruit here's how it finds them and how you can show the firm you have them one of mckinsey's goals as listed in its mission statement is to build a firm that is able to attract develop excite motivate and retain exceptional people. The first stage in reaching that objective is recruiting the best possible candidates to join the firm. As I've written elsewhere, McKinsey tries to skim off the cream, the elite of the elite at the top business schools, as well as law schools and economics and finance graduate programs. The firm also goes out of its way to recruit non-traditional candidates from outside the realms of business academia, doctors, scientists, and politikians, among others. Because the firm takes recruiting so seriously, it commits serious resources to it, probably more, proportionately, than any other business organization. Every top business school, for instance, has its own team of McKinsey consultants assigned to it, complete with its own charge code for expenses. The expenses can add up to 
sending four consultants from New York to Philadelphia. Faya, putting them up for five days at the best hotel in town, and taking out dozens of MBAs to fancy restaurants doesn't come cheap. Furthermore, the EM on the team makes recruiting a full-time commitment, at McKinsey's hourly rate, that represents a very large opportunity cost. Even on a small scale, McKinsey doesn't pinch pennies. When Kristen Aslison took a highly courted JD MBA out to lunch in New York, she took her to Le Cirque. Ivana Trump held court at a rear corner table. Walter Cronkite walked in. They nodded to each other. As Kristen recalls, we both thought that was pretty cool. With all this heavy weaponry, the firm hunts first and foremost for analytical ability. As one former recruiter told me, I always looked for analytical thinkers, people who could break apart problems into their components. I wanted Evie. 158 surviving at McKinsey. Denke that they knew how to structure problems. I also looked for business judgment, the sense that the person knew the implications of his solutions. That's why I always used cases. Cases are the weapon of choice in a McKinsey interview. They range from the prosaic, stripped-down versions of actual McKinsey cases, to the whimsical or even weird. Examples, how many gas stations are there in the United States? Why are manhole covers round? Asterisk in a case interview, the interviewer wants to see how well the interviewee can think about a problem, rather than how correctly she answers it. As with most business problems, there is no one true answer. Rather, succeeding in a case interview requires break ing the problem into its component pieces, asking relevant case tie-ins, and making reasonable assumptions when necessary. For instance, when figuring out the number of gas stations in the United States, you might start by asking how many cars there are in the country. The interviewer might tell you the number, or might say, I don't know. You tell me. Well, you say to yourself, the population of the U.S. is about 275 million. If the average household size, including singles, is, you guess, 2.5 people, then your trusty Calcu. Later asterisk asterisk tells you that yields 110 million households. The reviewer nods in agreement. You recall hearing somewhere that the average household has 1.8 cars, or was that children, so the United States must have 198 million cars. Now, if you can only figure out how. Recruiting McKinsey Style 159 Asterisk when I was joining the firm, one of my interviewers posed this challenge, you've just been appointed special assistant to the mayor of New York City. He wants to know how to make New York a better place. What do you tell him? Being a native Bostonian, I could have said a lot of things, first of all, get rid of the Yankees and the Mets, but I concentrated on breaking the problem into its components. It worked. You never know when you might need your calculator. See Chapter 16. Many gas stations it takes to serve 198 million cars, you'll have the problem solved. What matters is not the numbers, but the method you use to reach them. When I was asked this question in an interview, I was off by a factor of three, as the interviewer later told me, but it didn't matter for the purpose of testing my analytical ability. There's more to the successful would-be McKinseyite than just analytical ability, however. McKinsey consultants work in teams, so personality counts too. As Abe Bleiberg put it, I assumed that most of the people who made it into the interview process were smart enough to work at the firm. So I tried to answer the question, did I really want to work with this person? Quite often, I rejected super intelligent, nasty people. One of the great joys for me was saying, he's incredibly brilliant, and I wouldn't have him on my team for a million bucks. Beyond a candidate's fit with the interviewer, there is also a candidate's fit with the firm. To discover that, the interviewer has to get beyond the resume and penetrate the polish. Given how slick many candidates are, the process can be tough. For instance, Hamish McDermott met with one would-be McKinseyite from Harvard Business School. 
Hamish tried the TYP Eichel opening interview gambit, so, tell me a bit about yourself. Harvard man proceeded to give a very structured, prepared, and long spiel listing all his strengths, virtues, and life experiences. Knowing that he was hearing a script, Hamish interrupted him with a question. How would you characterize your analytical abilities, he asked. Not wishing to break the flow of his monologue, Harvard man replied, I'll get back to that question in 10 minutes. As Hamish recalls, that was not the response I was looking for. Oddly enough, Harvard man did not get an offer to join the firm. 160 Surviving at McKinsey No doubt, many of you want to know how to get a job at McKinsey. The answer is simple, be of above average intelligence, possess a record of academic achievement at a good college and a top business school, show evidence of achievement in all previous jobs, and demonstrate extraordinary analytical ability. Simple to say, but not simple to do. If you manage to clear all those hurdles, the key to your joining the firm may be the case interview. I've already talked about cases, but I'll leave you with the best description of how to handle a case, courtesy of Jason Klein. I always ask the same case. I wasn't looking for a particular answer, but I wanted to see how people dealt with a complex problem in which a lot of information gets thrown at them at once. Some people froze, others just dug deeper and deeper. They were the people I recommended. 19. If you want a life, lay down some rules. When you work 80 hours or more per week, after eating, sleeping, and, you hope, personal hygiene, there's not much time left over for anything else. If you want a life, you have to do a little advance work. One especially bittersweet memory of my time at the firm comes from a study I did for a Wall Street investment bank. My girlfriend, now my wife, worked as a portfolio strategist in the same build ING as my client, and she had a schedule just as punishing as mine. Many times during the five months of that study we shared a cab ride home, at 2 a.m. When I asked former McKinseyites how they left room for a social life, many of them replied that they didn't. As one of them told me, I didn't do a good job of it because I didn't make enough rules. I was too afraid of jeopardizing my career. The lesson he learned, if only in hindsight, was that if you want a life when you work crazy hours, then you have to lay down some rules. Hours of discussion with former McKinseyites have yielded three rules for a better life while at the firm. Make one day a week off limits. Pick a day, most people take Saturday or Sunday, and tell your boss, and yourself, that you never work on that day unless it's an absolute emergency. Most bosses, at least in my experience, will respect that most of the time. Make sure that you respect it too. Spend that day with your friends, your family, or just the Sunday papers. Keep your mind off work and relax a bit. Don't take work home. Keep work and home separate. If you need to stay at the office for another hour, that's better than coming home and ignoring your kids because you still have work to do. Home should be a place where you can be yourself. Plan ahead. If you travel during the work week, this is the most important rule. Don't come back from the airport on a Friday night and expect to find stuff to do over the weekend. When you're out of town, you're out of sight and out. 164 Surviving at McKinsey Of mind, especially when you're single. If you want to do anything more than curl up with a good book, then you have to arrange things in advance. Rules offer the great advantage of letting everyone know what to expect, your boss, your significant other, your kids, and you. Of course, it can sometimes be difficult to stick to even these very basic rules. When your priorities are, client, firm, you, sometimes you have to let your life take a backseat to your career. That leads to my final rule. When all else fails, have a doorman. Then, at least, you'll come home to clean laundry. <laughs>